KLDR Online, Leadership Development Radio. Thank you for joining the Maverick Paradox. And now, here is your host, Judith Germain. Welcome to the Maverick Paradox at KLDR, where we recognize that effective Maverick leaders are known for their divergent thinking and ability to execute well. Each week, we explore Maverick leadership in all its guises, exploring what it is to be an effective Maverick leader with experts in diverse fields. And today, I'm joined by David Chislett, a creativity activator and keynote speaker. He turns people and organizations into weapons of mass creation. Hi, David. Hi, Judith. How are you today? I am really good. And welcome to the show. I'm really interested in finding out why you are a Maverick leader. Because I'm really bad at following the rules. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I I have actually had jobs in big companies, but they've never lasted long. I, I think my absolute record is nine months and my worst is two weeks. Wow. And I, what, what seems to go wrong is that I'm a kind of person, I walk into a situation and you give me my job and you say, well, this is what you need to do. And you show me the system and I go for it. But then a few days later, I'm going to come back and I'm going to say, well, you know, if we did this differently or we changed that, we could save time, we could save effort, we could drop out some redundancy. And that hasn't always gone down very well. I I just can't help myself. I'm constantly joining the dots. I walk into situations, I very quickly assimilate what's going on, and then I synthesize some kind of a solution. I just It's just the way my mind works. Mm. So, yeah, I think that's what my readers do, don't they? They're looking for the right result and the exact uh, steps that you take is irrelevant as long as the results are right. They're not talking about doing things in a unethical way. It's just doing things the best way. Well, I mean, my focus was always on this could be this could be easier. This could be more efficient. This could be more productive, which is going to help everyone, not just me. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it wasn't about goofing off, about taking shortcuts, although quite often what I was coming up with were indeed shortcuts, but ones that helped everyone, not just making my life easy. Hmm. You just think companies would want more of that. So when you're working with your corporate clients, how does that play out? Well, you know, if you're talking to me, one would hope that you are a little less wedded to that assembly line model of ticking the boxes <laughs> and, and what have you than, than some other people are. Um, but it is difficult because as much as human beings are inherently creative and looking to the future and constantly growing and changing, we are also highly social herd animals who are very good at recognizing patterns. And if you follow a pattern long enough, it becomes habituated, automated behavior. And changing that is hard work, and it involves pain, um, and it involves breaking rules. And so that can be quite challenging for clients, this idea that, you know, we're going to change the way you do what you do in order to get a different result. Um, Mm. Quite often, people are quite keen to do the thinking but not so much to do the doing that the thinking implies yeah or the, they're fine with the the thinking but the executing so as long right. as the plan seems good on paper it can stay in that planning stage isn't it and then you might start the doing yeah. but not completing it well enough for you to say actually this has been executed Correct. It's because to execute it, behavior needs to change. Yes. And not just by the executor, by the manager as well, because their role's going to change. You know what? I have never thought of execution as a behavioral change. That explains so much why it doesn't get done. (laughs) Because people don't want to change because they've got habits and they've got opinions and they've got, you know, they're set in their ways. I've never considered it like that. That's fantastic. David, can you tell me about your own leadership journey? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I laugh because I sometimes wonder if I am a socialized maverick or just a maverick. You know, I've I've pretty much worked (laughs) for myself my entire life. Um, 
but more recently in the last five years, I've, I've, I've come to the realization that maybe because of that, I know a whole bunch of stuff that other people don't actually just bump into in the normal course of, of, a, of a nine to five job. Um, because I've existed on the peripheries for so long, I've had a, a helicopter view of many, many different things and seen a lot of connections, which, you know, I mean, without, I mean, this sounds awfully egotistical, actually, but when you're in an organization, in a job, driving towards specific KPIs, KPAs and deliverables, you just don't have the privilege of, of scooting out far enough to see what is actually my vantage point as an outsider. Mm-hmm. And when I realized that that was not only true, but that it was valuable and that I had the means to share it, that's when I thought, well, I'm going to actually embrace this idea of being, well, leader is not a word I use, but a teacher, you know, someone who's got stuff to share that can help. Um, and so that's what I'm up to. I'm, I'm trying to help people find their way to their future by unpacking what has not been working up until now and discovering ways to change your behavior so that you can get a different result. Hmm. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So what did you do when you had that job for two weeks? I mean, how old were you? Oh, how old was I? Let me think now. That was 1998. I was 28. Wow, I thought was going to say 18. <laughs> <laughs> what no. was wrong with that job? Because, I mean, two weeks is, is not very long. No. I was working in sports marketing. Um, I was living in Johannesburg. I found a girlfriend in Cape Town. I found a job in Cape Town and resigned and took the new job, moved to Cape Town. And I, I went from being on the event side of sport marketing, the logistics, to being on the media liaison side of sports oh, marketing. That's and I said you. to the guy, look, I've been a journalist. I, I, I know how media works, but I've never done this job before. I'm going to need handholding. I'm going to need guidance. And he was like, yes, absolutely. I've been doing it for two decades. And I got there and he went on leave <laughs> after giving me a multi-million contract to deliver on a launch of a new sponsorship in a sporting environment. And I didn't appreciate that. So I did it and I resigned with immediate notice on the day of the event and left before he even got back from leave. (laughs) So did the event go well? Did it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it did. Because I, everyone else who was there rallied round and helped me. And, you know, there was an amazing team um, who formed around that event. And we just pulled in partners to fill the gaps. And I learned really, really, really fast. Um, and, it, <laughs> and it went fine. You know, I mean, it could have been better. But all things considered, uh, the MD of the company actually came up to me after the event and said, please, will you reconsider your resignation? And I said, yeah. not a chance. I'm not working with that man. He dropped me and he dropped me big time. I don't trust him. I'm not staying. See, that's an interesting thing because that maverick leader around trust, because it, because you could, you did the work because you're adaptable, flexible. I mean, yeah. after all, you know, you're able to make what well, your creativity act, activator. So you know how to make it work in a creative yeah. space. But can you trust that person long term? I mean, I think if he'd turn around and said to you, I will be going on holiday, here are the people you need to speak to then you might have had a different reaction. Totally. I mean, you know, expectation management is the term. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, my expectations were very different to the reality I was confronted with. Mm, mm. Yeah, I still think it's quite impressive, though, that you managed to to pull that off. Or do you just see it as you're a maverick as, well, of course, because... Well, to be honest with you, it's all a bit of a blur. I mean, it was insane. (laughs) Um, but, but the, the, the logistics woman w- was a rock and she just, she got all the, all the moving parts of the actual event together. And she just managed me as well as part of her team and said, you know, where are these materials? Have you got this checklist? Have you spoken to these people? Don't forget to do that. And she just, you know, she did what I was expecting my actual boss to do mm-hmm. on top of what she had to do. So what did you learn from that experience? Well, that was my last full-time job for a while. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I don't, in the moment, I actually don't think I ever turned around and looked at it as a learning experience. I, I think what I learned from it potentially was not good. It was just distrust. It was just um, not relying on other people, um, going my own way. You know, I don't, made you more of a maverick. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what's the leadership journey that you can share for the audience in terms of your own business? What have you learned along the way that would be useful for others? You know, I think it's really important to go gently on yourself. Um, as, as, as people have pointed out, uh, you not least amongst them, I haven't always had a particularly coherent strategy. Um, I've been very busy. I do a lot of things and I work very hard. But from the outside, it hasn't always been very apparent where that's all going or what the point is. And when I first realized that, I, yeah, that didn't feel great. You know, I was like, ah, oh, come on, you know, burning so much gas and no one's noticing. And they're not noticing because of what I haven't done, you know, or, or, the, or the, the way I have done things. And then I was just like, well, okay, so let's, let's fix it. Um, and I think that's that's incredibly important. That ability, you've got to hone that that ability to just disconnect from your emotional response to mistakes and say, okay, how do I fix this? And you know, take however long it takes to mope about it and beat yourself up or whatever <laughs> you're going to do, but then get busy, you know, and um, and fix it. And that for me was quite. A, and also, I got a lot of advice, you know, from a variety of people. So the second learning is don't get too much advice, confusing. Um, and then the third thing I learned is that, you know, as long as you are constantly adjusting, it'll all come good at the end of the day. And is it about succeeding at your first try or is it about staying in the game long enough to succeed? Mm -hmm. And so by being a little less hard on myself I've developed a slightly longer term vision on what I'm doing and I'm kind of going you know it's okay it's okay this is this gig's new it's it's two three years old um I'm totally committed I'm not going anywhere I am making mistakes and that is inhibiting my progress but there is progress and they will continue to be progress so yeah that for me was was quite a powerful realization mm. and also is it to think your ability to absorb the mistakes and the perceived failures and then change them to your advantage something that everybody needs to be able to do yeah I think that perspective shift I don't think it's an ability necessarily um although I suppose you know you could talk about resilience um but it's more about a mental capacity to shift gear to, to kind of go I'm going to reframe what just happened into a learning opportunity it's like okay what went wrong what do other people do what do I need to do to make it go right? And, and kind of just deconstruct it um, into a series of action steps rather than, oh, my God, I'm such an idiot. I really screwed that up, uh, which is tempting, you know, and, and, and I must admit is probably still my primary reaction. Um, but I'm getting better at then going, all right, so exactly what you just asked about that job that lasted two weeks, what did I learn here? <laughs> <laughs> now I ask that question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, what it can be really difficult to to stay there in that failure. And maybe it's looking at the word failure and not seeing it as a negative, like a neutral word. So yeah. it didn't work. It failed. Well, the, the thing that really, like, really made the penny drop for me was someone said to me, if you do something and you succeed, what do you learn? <laughs> and it's like, well, uh, well, that it worked, right. But if you do something and you fail, what do you learn? And so you always learn something when stuff goes wrong. You're like, oh, so those tolerances are different. Oh, so the market doesn't like that. Oh, so people don't like it when I use the exclamation marks in emails. Um, <laughs> <you know? laughs> and then you and then you use that to change, to develop. So once I got that on board, it was like, yeah, okay, that's true. Actually, 
you know, so it's, it's, it's hugely hip at the moment, isn't it? You know, failure is the new success, blah, 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 which is nauseating. Um, but, but mainly nauseating because it's, you know, like most cliches, it contains a large kernel of truth. Failure is invaluable because you learn. You know what I think? I don't know. I'm going to ask you what I find nauseating in that phrase is almost like people are looking to fail and calling that a success. And that doesn't make that's not yeah. the same as saying if I fail, I'll learn and move on. So I won't be hung up on it. Yeah. So this kind of fail fast. It's almost like let's find all the things we can fail. Who will be successful? And it doesn't seem in my maverick brain, it does that doesn't seem to make sense. No, but you're absolutely right. That's it. You see, that's what people are doing. They've it, it's become such a social media meme that literally people have forgotten about the learning from the mistakes part and they're just trying to crash into as much failure as they can on the assumption that that is magically going to transform into success. And it's not. That's like that's the secret, right? Yeah. If you think it'll happen, it'll happen. It's like, no. <laughs> You're going to think it'll happen and you've got to do the work and you've got to show yeah. up and you've got to consistently show up and you've got to be focused on improvement and then it'll, then you'll get the success. Yeah. Cause it's that kind of like, if we, if we break it often enough, as you said, magically that we'd be able to come up with the answer, but that, that's such a false fallacy. I think, I think you only come up with that answer when you've thought about why it's failed well, it's and you get what you think about. Because it is, it is magical thinking, you know, and, and magical thinking is a powerful evolutionary tool. You know, it's what enables us to do unbelievable things because we believe in the magic. Um, mm-hmm. But again, when you, when you do unbelievable things, you know, there's, there's a key little short word in that sentence, do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, and unfortunately, quite often, magical thinking is divorced from action. That's that's true. Magical thinking is great if you're taking action. (laughs) Thanks for that. Thanks for that, David. That makes perfect sense to me. And I think it's a good time to have a break. So when we return, we'll talk about how creativity will help you change the world. Each week, Judith Germain welcomes onto the Maverick Paradox podcast a guest to explore what it is to be a maverick, a willfully independent person, and to discover effective modes of leadership. Her guests are experts drawn from all walks of life, discussing how their area of specialism, or how they think, demonstrates maverick leadership or behaviour. The Maverick Paradox podcast is a relaxed conversation with guests, where they show that maverick thinking encompasses all aspects of our working lives. Judith's podcast is amongst the global top 10% most popular shows in the world, and can be found on popular podcast platforms. Thank you for joining the Maverick Paradox at KLDR, where we explore maverick leadership in all its guises. This is the station for the pathologically curious who want to be challenged by divergent thinkers. I am your host, Judith Germain, and I'm joined today by David Chisler. So, David, you make a really bold statement that creativity will, ma- will change the world. Yeah. So tell me, what do you mean? <laughs> well, it has already, right? I mean... Social media. Mm-hmm. 15 years? Has it been that long? Oh. Yes, it is. It is, yeah. Right. So someone created social media. And what did it do? It changed the world. Mm. Someone figured out how to make fire on demand. And that <laughs> changed our diet, which changed our ability, which changed our brains, which changed the world. Someone figured out that, wow, logs roll. What happens if we cut little sections off and attach them to things to move stuff that's too heavy to carry? And that changed the world. We routinely and habitually underestimate our own capacity for creative thinking. It is so everyday to us that when we grab that butter knife and tighten that screw in the door handle, We do not conceive of that as a creative act. But problem solving is the essence of creative thought. That's, that's, you know, why we're at the apex of the food chain we're busy destroying, because we have this ability (laughs) to bend, blend, and break the world around us into new shapes and configurations which give us different outcomes. There's no way 
skinny, underpowered, unarmored beings like ourselves should still be alive. Creativity Mm. is the capacity that has given us that. And now we've used that creativity to create a system which is destroying the place that we live and the people who live in it. And it's time to change. And it's no coincidence that the majority of people that you speak to today do not consider themselves creative. They are disempowered. They do not think themselves capable of doing anything today that will change what happens tomorrow. And that's what I want to change. That's why my vision is that creativity can change the world. Because if I can persuade enough people that the ideas and the solutions that they come up with are in fact valid and viable and should be acted on, we will reach a tipping point where regardless Mm. of our stupid politicians and our corrupt leaders and the completely messed up corporate and financial system that we live under, human beings will start to change their behavior and the momentum and the impetus of that will impact the system. You know what, that's so interesting because I think when we look back, we don't see any of those innovations as actual single points of creativity that have you know converged together. And I think maybe that's what's wrong with the workplace is that we've forgotten that every minute we're in that workplace, we can be and are being creative. Yeah. You know, it's just a job. You're just ticking boxes so that the, you know, it's, it's not that people aren't creative. It's that we've got the wrong story about it somewhere along the line conveniently creativity has been pigeonholed into art and Mm. conveniently a lot of artists are mavericks and are outliers (laughs) and so along with the notion of being creative has come the notion of being somewhat weird somewhat unmanageable quite possibly being a drag addict or being in some (laughs) way asocial antisocial or problematic And so this whole creative instinct has been kind of externalized and shoved into this little corner so that the rest of us can behave like good little robots and punch our holes in the metal on the assembly line uh, to the the boss's content. You know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, okay? Don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about the (laughs) Illuminati here. I'm just saying that, you know, we on some level have been utterly brainwashed into this notion that we cannot conceive and act on our own ideas of our futures. Mm. You do think it's because if every single individual in the organisation was creative with what they did, still got the results, but were creative in the manner of what they did, do you think it would be deemed too hard to manage and that's why it's being squished? Yes. And that's why it should be allowed because... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thanks to computer technology, that whole tranche of bureaucracy is already actually redundant. No, we don't need them. And this is also incredibly what the pandemic has made brutally obvious. You know, People can work from home. They can work remotely. They don't need to be micromanaged. All of those, you know, that whole, tr- that whole like middle sphere of management is, is redundant. Now imagine if all that mattered was that you that you produced the outcomes. What would those people do? What would those middle management do? Mm. That's what's so interesting because that's how maverick leaders tend to think, and the maverick in the organisation, like yourself, doesn't last a long, long time because they're they're in that spot of imagine what it'd be like if I just did what needed to be done, and I know that the what people are saying or what the experts are saying with AI is that the industrial revolution, for example, got rid of the low skilled individuals, but they say the revolution that's coming now is going to, it will take off some of the low skilled work. Yes. But it will also hit the middle management stage as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, And I think that's what's probably going to be the biggest shock. Yeah. All these managers with no jobs. Yeah. And lawyers. And surgeons and, in, you know, an interesting array of people. You know, the more niched you are, the more um, you know, the more well-defined the knowledge set is that's required to do your job, the more likely you are to lose it to AI. 
Because what AI can't do is stuff that requires a broad skill set. I mean, it can <sighs> eventually, but we, we are nowhere near the computing power required to do that. But we are already on top of the computing power required to do tightly niched, well-defined tasks, i.e. highly specialist, highly educated jobs. Because that's why they're saying with the IE, uh, IE, that's what they're saying with the AI, that they're going, that people like accountants, so like your bookkeeping will go, accountancy will go to a certain level and all this sort of stuff, because it's, even as you said, like the GP, you know, they like talk to an AI and tell them the symptoms and it will, it will tell you what's, what's wrong. Although I'm not too sure I'd like to. I don't know. Wait, see, actually, not a GP, a brain surgeon. A GP is too broad. Okay, okay. Because a GP also needs to know about your eating habits, your sleeping habits, your relationship status, your work, your stress. It's too broad. Whereas someone who needs to remove a tumor from your brain, well, a computer and a robot are going to make a lot less mistakes than someone who might have a hangover or have fought with his partner or, 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 or. Gosh, you know what? That will completely upend the world. Yes. Well, no, it will upend. No, it will. The Western <laughs> world, yeah. in a way, because because we're relying on this kind of knowledge worker. Um, you know, we, yeah, we, in our little golden cage over here in, in in Western Europe, we are very much using the historical financial advantage that slavery, colonialism, and empire has given us to try and monopolize the niche on knowledge mm-hmm. um, when that impediment is removed the normal human capacity for invention innovation and creation will be democratized in a way that has never been seen before and the question is whether we're going to allow that to happen or whether we're going to entrench the status quo and keep that knowledge within the the, the ranks of the rich that's why the universal income grant is so important because that cannot be allowed to happen. The digital divide cannot be allowed to deepen or even to continue to exist. This is fascinating. And this is why you need the maverick leaders. You need that creativity. You need those people to see not only the bigger picture, but what's best for everyone yeah. rather than the best for the few. So I know that you, you're a creativity activator and I personally can attest to how good you are at sparking that creativity. So you've published seven books yeah, and you've played in your bands and you've made documentary films. So for a conformist, that sounds like, huh? this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. But looking at it from as a maverick leadership perspective, I'm like, this sounds so cool. So tell me about all of that. <laughs> Well, you know, it's 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 funny because you're right. That is a, a, a sort of stereotypical reaction. You know, it's like wow. But when if you ever meet someone who's a highly accomplished musician, if you probe, you'll find out that they're also a great chef, or you know, they do watercolors for fun, or you know, highly creative people who are specialized in one particular creative skill, particularly an artistic skill, typically actually are better than average in another one as well. Mm. Why? Well, because they figured out how the creative process works. And they've also Um, realized that all you need to do is acquire a new skill and just drive the skill through the process to get the creative outcome. Um, And so you're right. You know, for me, I'm just like, well, duh, all you got to do is acquire a few skills. You know, once you've got this joining the dots, duh, duh, duh thing going on in your head, it's just like, okay, well, this set of ideas I've come up with, I'm going to drive through this engine and this set, I'm going to drive through this engine and this engine, and I'm going to have all these different outcomes, which to the world out there look totally disparate and weird and, 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 and disconnected, but they're not. They're all coming from the same place, which is joining the dots, which is looking at the world and going, I can reconfigure that into something else i like that i can reconfigure that yeah yes that is is the ultimate like creative expression yeah i can reconfigure that every maverick thinks that even though it's probably not expressed in that way yeah i like that so your books seven of them are they all on the same topic are they all different of course not (laughs) (laughs) so i have i have I edited and compiled a a series of short stories called the Urban Series. There were three books in that. Um, 
I have published a collection of my own short stories. I've published two volumes of my poetry. I published a nonfiction guide to the business of the music industry. And I have published a nonfiction book called The Entrepreneur's Toolbox, which is aimed at helping what, you know, in the current parlance would be solopreneurs not to completely mess themselves up while mm-hmm. chasing the business dream. Wow. And am I right in saying that you've also done a very innovative writing course too? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I've been on, on stage since I was 10 years old, presenting, acting, speaking, what have you. Um, and, you know, by twists of fate, I've done a lot of training. And, uh, and in the Netherlands, I did a lot of business language training. And during lockdown, I was like, you know, I've always kind of thought it'd be cool to do a digital online course. So I, I did <laughs> um, with some help of some uh, two lovely Hungarians living in Harlem in the Netherlands. We, we, I wrote the script, they did the video shooting and editing and all the artwork. And we've, we are launching this, this wonderful course called Rock Your Writing on, on the Teachable platform. Um, and it's, you know, it's dirt cheap. It's eight modules. And it's, it's all about joining the dots in a new way, about going, hey, English is a system. Here are the dots. And if you join them in this way, this is the impact you can have. Mm-hmm. And you've been the maverick. How is that different from um, a writing course that anybody anybody else has written? Well, it's not boring. For a start. <laughs> um, it looks great. Uh, very high production values. So it's 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 called rock your writing for a reason. You know, it's very rock and roll. It's high tempo. It's flashy. It's it's gaudy. Um, but it's also it's not about writing a novel. Or you know, a lot of the writing courses you will see are creative writing courses. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how do you string a sentence together in a way that has the impact that you want and transmits the meaning that you had in mind and doesn't confuse people. How do you do that on a regular basis? in a way that doesn't burn all of your mental energy and that therefore doesn't burn all the mental energy of the person reading it. That's what rock your writing gives you. Oh, wow. So that's useful then for any leader that wants to improve their impact. Absolutely. You know, okay. you, it'll teach you how to express yourself in the, right, in the written word in the most efficient way. Your English is lovely. We've got something over a million words in our vocabulary, a lot of them mean almost the same thing. So if you park (laughs) three words in a row next to each other, thinking, okay, by giving you all three of these options, I'm I'm really guiding you. You're not. You're giving me three times three options instead of just picking the one word that means exactly what you mean. And that's just a small example of what the course is designed to do. Okay, so if your maverick leadership takes you into the entrepreneurial space, I guess something like that, that rock your writing, will make you do your marketing better, presumably? Well, it'll make your message more obvious and it'll make your message land harder by -hmm. teaching you how to use the tenses and your word choice and your sentence length for effect. Um, So, yeah, it'll, it'll it'll make your message and your mission a hell of a lot clearer. But hmm. by the same token, if you're a leader in a corporate environment, um, you can make your written communication far more accessible and transparent by learning how to write in a way that is not easily mistaken for smoke and mirrors. Uh, so that builds reputation and credibility, right? Right. Excellent. I like that. I like Because you know what? It's not something, you know, native English, British English speaker, you know, I got my A in English grammar. <laughs> I, think right. I'm, I can write, but I suppose things have moved on, isn't it? And well, it's not even that. It's like, yeah, you learned the grammar, you learned how to spell, you learned how to hold a pen. But did anyone ever sit you down and say, this is how you compose a piece of writing as a native speaker? Mm, probably not. No, you, we just don't get taught that at school. So yeah, it's not it's just okay. for second language speakers although it is, it's very useful for second language. It's for, it's for us, it's for us natives who quite often write a form of English which is opaque to just about everybody else. Yeah. 
I love that. Thanks for that, David. I think this has been a great conversation and I can totally understand what you're saying when I work with business owners and they're trying to get their message out. Again, it's always, you've seen too much. You need to, to break that down, make it clear. Yeah. So when we return back from our break, I know you've got a couple of questions for me and I'm dead scared as to what they might be. <laughs> Speak to you all soon. To survive and thrive in this complex, fast-moving world, we need effective maverick leaders who are change eager, able to strategize, innovate and execute and are able to work for the greater good with integrity, empathy and passion. This remains true regardless of whether you run your own business or work within someone else's. Judith Germain has been defining mavericks as willfully independent people since 2005 and recognizes that effective maverick leaders are known for their divergent thinking and ability to execute well. The Maverick Paradox at KLDR is a weekly conversational show that explores maverick leadership in all its guises, exploring what it is to be an effective maverick leader with experts in diverse fields. Come join us. The Maverick Paradox is for the pathologically curious. Okay. Thank you for coming back to the Maverick Paradox at KLDR, where we stoke your curiosity on all things Maverick. So, David, yeah. duh, 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 what question you turn on the hot seat. Me? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I'm interested in the answer to this question because it's a challenge that I face in my business. How do you make people care? about this idea of maverick leadership. I mean, maverick's a very loaded word, which has a very, quite a lot of cultural baggage. Like, how do you unpack that so that people understand what you're really talking about? Oh, that's a really good question. I think, first of all, it comes with a definition. So I've defined it to mean willfully independent person. Right. And I go to great lengths to, to expand that even more so that when I'm having that conversation, whether it's, actually conversational or if it's written down people know exactly the context of the discussion so that i deload it i guess so that we're back on the same page um so you're front then, loading the message with the answer yeah because it's true actually because when people say oh maverick means this i say uh-huh well actually i define it this way <laughs> so i never i never really have a conversation until we understand where i'm coming from <sighs> <laughs> and in fact when that. i'm working with when i'm working with leaders over their um smes or in an organization i always say you need to context contextualize what it is that you're talking about so that that person's head's empty and they're starting from where you are starting and then you're more likely to be on the same same board and i guess maverick leadership that ability to work for the greater good to have integrity to be trusted to get stuff done because you said you're going to get it done is something I think we all can intuitively understand that that's something that we need. And I always look, like I suppose of any leader really, is how do you align an individual to something, an idea or a concept? So you need to start off with what they want. So I'm, you know, I'm always like, what is it that you're looking for? And yeah. when I understand from the questioning and the challenging, aha, this is what they really want then I show them how Maverick Leadership gives them that thing that they're looking for, right. rather than me sort of saying, care about this because I care about it. Yeah. You know, it's more of a case of, if you want to achieve what you want to achieve, then you need to, need to understand this. And I suppose Maverick Leadership, unlike other forms of leadership, whether it's action-centred, you know, um, situational leadership or whatever leadership style that you've been taught in the past, isn't it's maverick right so it's not structured it's a set of principles it's a set of decisions that are made it's a set of who you are and what you do so it's not a straitjacket you know so if you understand the philosophy and the principles you can use that to achieve anything you're looking for right oh question two is um maverick leadership isn't structured huh? i've known you <laughs> for a couple of years and one thing that's impressed the hell out of me about you is that you're incredibly structured. You've got, you've got a program, you've got a strategy, you've got a plan, you've got the moving parts, you've got the hard clicks together. How do you, I, I, well, and I, I mean, obviously I had a lot of preconceptions about this whole idea of maverick leadership. I can only think a lot of people who come to you, are they going to be horribly surprised when actually you're teaching them 
well, you're showing or sharing with them some kind of a structure. I don't think that that's intuitively where most people would think this goes. Okay, I like that. I like the way you challenged me. It's structure without structure, which is what Mavericks like. So basically, the structure is a boundary, I guess. It's a strategic direction of what you want to achieve. And the no structure bit is you have a way of doing that. But if the outcome is what we're looking for, then that's okay. Bear in mind, the boundary, the structure is ethical, principled, you have empathy, you're tolerant, inclusive. You know, so the, those is those are the structures and the doing is what works best for you within this structured boundary. Does, does that help? Yeah, it does. Because, you know, when I think of structure, I tend to think of something like a skeleton. Yeah, it's like but what you're talking about is not a skeleton. That's, that's a traditional structure. It's more like a, uh, a skin <laughs> yeah so like if you think one of the attributes of mavericks is um having an honest belief so don't so so that would be part of the structure and the non-structure would be if you don't honestly believe it's the right thing to do don't do it <laughs> so that comes right. that, that feeds into cognitive dissonance being principled you know if i actually do something david which you feel is the wrong thing i know having no new you won't do it yeah because okay. you don't, you don't have. I mean, you'll listen and you'll challenge, but if I can't convince you it's the right thing to do, then you're not doing it. And I think that's the part of maverick leadership. More people need to get behind. You know, you have to honestly believe that this is the right thing or solution to do. And as the maverick leadership expert, do you consider yourself <laughs> a highly creative person? You know what? I didn't used to. <laughs> Until I was speaking to you and then you basically said, but what about this, this, this and this? And then I went, oh, yeah. Although it's really funny because the only way I can kind of get behind it, and you're going to laugh at me now, is I see it as innovating. So somehow I can be innovating and that's okay, but creative, I don't know. I I don't know. I just kind of, I don't know why is it about the creativity word that I struggle with. And I think it's because... For too long in my life, that means artistic expression. Unprofessional. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems to be, I guess it's just because I, I've heard it so long, you know, I'm, and I say, to, I've said it to myself a lot of times, I'm just not creative. Yeah. But I do feel like I, I see innovation in how I work with clients. And I take some complex thing that they do and I turn it into some simplistic form and goes, well, this is what it is. And they're like, people say, oh, my gosh, that's so innovative. That's so creative. But I just don't seem to, I don't know, I just can't seem to wear the creativity part. <laughs> Welcome to the challenges of my world. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, it's almost as if, you, I think you could do well by defining what creativity means in your space in the same way I've defi- defined what maverick means in my yeah, yeah. space. I was, I was I think once... long mental notes when you answered that question. I'm like, yeah, I'm totally stealing that. I'm going to, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing that. Because <laughs> when you, because when I understood what you meant for creativity, I could see it. Because when you said, but Jude, you're really creative. And I was like, I am so not. Because I look at you as being really creative. Look at all the stuff that you've done. But then when you flipped it over, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. really creative. Oh, look, you created an <laughs> online magazine. Oh, look, you created a radio show. Oh, look, you created a podcast. Oh, look, you created a business. <laughs> what does your business do? Oh, I create solutions for people. Oh, oh, you're not creative. No. <laughs> you know, part of it, though, as well, is that it doesn't – I think I've always thought of creativity, maybe because, like, you know, companies have creativity – departments and stuff as something extra whereas all the innovations I did over time oh. they seem normal like why would I not you know I got to this point no but that's it think. that's exactly it it's, it's always it's an add-on it's a nice to have yeah exactly whereas I, I haven't got time for nice to haves <laughs> whereas the, the it's innovation intrinsic in, it's, in the it's, business it's, yeah, yeah. And it's like well this makes sense now the next innovation is this the next innovation is this I don't have time to sit there and be creative, but I will innovate like crazy. And I think maybe that's what it is. So so that's my tip to you. <laughs> yeah. Maybe to define what creativity is in your world. And then I think people will definitely get behind it because you, you do it so well. Why, right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, indeed. I think that's a good one. I'm definitely going to do that. All right. Have I got time for another question? Yes, you do. All right, good. Let me quickly create one for you. Um, you know, we were talking earlier on about creativity has the, you know, can change the world. Uh -huh. What can maverick leadership do to the world? Oh, so it's going to sound like I'm stealing because I'm going to say save the world. Um, because I believe that if everybody is working from a principled point of view, working for the greater good, they have integrity so they can see the, the wholeness of how everything's interconnected and integrity of character, then that effect will ripple on. So it will change the way we do business. It will change the way we interact as individuals and in the way it will save the world that we won't, we'll look at leaders, I'm on soapbox now, but we'll look at leaders and we'll say, that's not on. That's not the truth. Or if you do that in this country, it will affect that country and that's no longer acceptable. So I think, you know, the more maverick leaders that we have, the more likely we'll save the world wow. from us. Did you see in the news, one of the OPEC leaders came out and said that the OPEC countries need to start focusing on renewable energy and, and, and start letting go of oil. Uh, that's a maverick leader because the official standpoint of OPEC is climate denial. Yeah. And he's come out and said, we need to go renewable. And if you think about it, like just the Gulf countries, can you imagine how much sun, solar energy they could generate? You know, <laughs> I know it's crazy. Dave, these questions have been absolutely fantastic. So thank you for that. We're going to have a quick break. And when we return from the break, I've got a question for you. Judith Germain is the leading authority on Maverick Leadership, an author, speaker, consultant, mentor and trainer. She is the founder of the Maverick Paradox specializing in maverick leadership and enabling individuals, business owners, and organizations to improve their impact and influence. She is also HR Zone's leadership columnist, and her expert opinion has appeared in national, international, and trade press. The Maverick Paradox supports organizations to enhance their leadership capability and business owners to develop and grow their business. Judith is a business mentor and Chartered Fellow of the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development with over 20 years senior strategic and operational experience in HR. She's also the editor and founder of The Maverick Paradox and can be found at maverickparadox.co.uk and The Maverick Paradox magazine at themaverickparadox.com. There we go. Didn't hear her. Welcome back to the Maverick Paradox at KLDR. David, can you share with us any leadership hacks or lessons? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as a leader, as a creative leader, if you want more creativity because you want more problem solving, you want more innovation, you want more ideas for change, um, there are some very crucial things that you need to be able to, 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 um, to, to create. In, in, in the working environment and to hold. And, you know, in order to be creative, we have to let go of the known. And, you know, no one likes stepping into the unknown. It's risky. It's, it's vulnerable. So step number one, as a creative leader, you need to create and hold safe spaces because the creative mindset demands that we become comfortable with ambiguity, with complexity, and with seeking out the new. In other words, you're just, you're just jumping into the abyss. You're, you're, you're swimming out to sea, but no idea where you're going because that's when the creative process kicks off and that's when the dots become apparent. You could start to on the fly see connections. So as a leader, you've got to create and hold those spaces. You've got to create spaces where you don't have managers going, yeah, but we can't afford that. Or, oh, yeah, but you're just a junior or any of that nonsense. It's just got to be eradicated. So that's step number one. And step number two is that those spaces need to be created and held on a regular basis because creativity is not actually a skill, but it responds like a skill. The more you do it, the more you get of it. And, you know, there's a great book by uh, uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi called Flow. And when you get into flow, when you're working just beyond your established capacity, things start to happen in a way that doesn't seem to require any effort. It's the same with creativity. But just like Ronaldo will not get into flow if he didn't spend hours every day on the training pitch, 
your creative flow isn't going to happen if you don't spend hours in a creative mindset. So as a creative leader, if you want the magic source, you've got to hold space which is safe enough for people to leave their comfort zones and to go and get it or to make it. Hmm. And you've got to do it often. You know, innovation it, camps once a quarter are not enough. I like that, but I'm curious now. You said creativity is not a skill. What is it? It's a capacity. It's a thing that we are, it's like our capacity for language. All human beings seem to be biologically hardwired to speak a language. We have yet to discover any isolated humans that don't have a language with a grammar. And it's the same with creativity. It is, it is a function of our consciousness, possibly, but most certainly our intelligence. Mm. So it's like when you feed children, you know, especially like little children, like toddlers, they're always being really creative with the toys they have. And it's us right. as adults that go, no, Johnny, you don't play with a car okay. like an aeroplane. You push it on the ground. So, right. And then I suppose when you go into school, it's like, yeah, Even that's worse. interesting. But So do you think like as adults, probably where you come in as the activator of creativity, that we have to activate the child within us? The curiosity? No. Oh. Because that's still there. We just have to unlearn a series of really bad destructive habits. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. It's about creating, it's about creating new synaptic pathways so the old ones can 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 fall away. Um, because it's a capacity, it's, it hasn't gone anywhere. It's just that we've accessed it so irregular. You know, it's, it's like a huge computer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what we've done with creativity is we put it on the external hard, hard drive in a data center on the other side of the planet instead of having it in your RAM. And you need it in your RAM so that you can access it every single day. Every time you boot up the machine, it's there. Um, it's there. But if, if you're not taking the actions that, that require it, it, it'll it'll remain at a distance to you you know what it just it, i just had a funny image in my head it's like when you get when you get in the car when you get when i get in the car it um you put the key in and stuff and then all, all the doors locked and it stops and says automatic lock activated and i could just imagine you're going sitting down it's like creativity activated <laughs> yeah stephen king in his wonderful book on writing says I sit down at the same time every day in the same chair and I write for the same amount of time every single day for the six months of the year that he does it. He says, literally, bum hits seat writing starts mm-hmm. because he has habituated his response to that stimulus. It's Pavlov's dog. Mm-hmm. And it is totally possible with creativity. It is possible through that kind of repetition to bring it online. It's not magic. It's not lightning. It doesn't require Greek women on clouds throwing thunderbolts. It is part of how your brain works, but you've got to automate it. You've got to habituate it. Brilliant. Dave, thanks so much for coming on the show. Been a pleasure. And thank you all for listening to The Maverick Paradox at KLDR, where we recognise that effective maverick leaders are known for their divergent thinking and ability to execute well. I'm your host, Steve Germain, and we have been joined by David Chislett, who turns people and organisations into weapons of mass creation. So you can find out more about David, who can help you get a fresh perspective on anything. So you can check him out at David Chislett, which is dot com, And he's a poet and he has a new book out as well, which you can find from his website. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you for joining the Maverick Paradox, only on KLDR Online, Leadership Development Radio. You can follow Judith on her fan page at Judith Germain.